<laughs> Welcome to the program, man. Uh, hey. Um, How did you get into theater? Uh, it was my sophomore year of high school. I was in choir. Yeah, sure. I uh, I was one of those kids who actually kind of made fun of the theater group. Yeah? Because I was like, that's not really me. Well, why is that? Yeah. I was just the typical, don't want to deal with anybody, introvert, try to stay away from people, try to stay out You're of the... You're in choir, st- though. I mean, you yeah. did new solos, you did chorus kind of stuff? I, like- I was just chorus. Okay, like ensemble. me, yeah. And then... I had just moved to a brand new high school okay. from a brand new town, and sure. my choir director was like, hey, Kevin, we need a, a tenor two for our quartet in uh, Bye Bye Birdie. Sure. And I was like, sure, why not? Mm-hmm. Why not try something new? So I was like, "Yeah, okay. And I get in there, and I started to like it because I was like, this is way different experience than I expected sure. to be in the first place. It was just so welcoming and mm-hmm. that's how i met like my closest best friends was through theater isn't that neat yeah yeah it's like i wouldn't have expected to meet those people especially people so close to like what i, I my ideologies and all that stuff i was like uh-huh this is interesting and they kept pulling me more into more shows and more shows and it's like i really enjoy and love doing this and mm-hmm. i keep one want to keep doing this and so i just kept doing it more and more and i've warmed up more Mm -hmm. and i started to warm up other people that whose thoughts process were like this is not okay this is no this is weird right because they for some reason most people i've interacted they like drag queens all that stuff i'm like right that's not that's what some people think, yeah. especially for guys, right? Usually yeah. it's not it's not a guy thing, yeah. right? And usually, but that's the odd thing is about for guys, man, there's tons of roles because there are not that many guys that want to do this. Yeah, stuff. no, <laughs> it's for guys. It's such an open environment. You're Absolutely, like, you can walk in, you can be a brand new person to the theater mm-hmm. company, yep, and you could get the lead role right then and there, and not even have to fight for it because. The it's, girls don't like that, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have to fight for the her. The girls are like, it's so good. That's not fair. <laughs> I have to nail this audition song perfectly. All this. And I got to look the right thing. I got to know these people. I gotta... <laughs> it's like, I have, to, I have to build all these connections. I'm like. And the guys are going, please, guys, come on. <laughs> Where <are> guys <laughs> show up? I'm auditioning because there's not enough guys. So please, guys, show up so uh, I can fade into the background of the show. But it's. Geez. It's always a blast. Oh my ch- goodness! Because, and one show I did, I actually in my college, um, I was leaving Iowa, and there was five guys. Yep. To twelve, thirteen. All right, after the two lead roles. Right. So there's three or four of us to go around. There's twelve different guy roles that need to be filled. So we're like triple cast, quadruple <laughs> cast. Um, so. Some care like I had to play I a hillbilly farmer mm-hmm. and then like two minutes later I had to play some confederate war leader. <laughs> it's two two completely opposite spectrums of mm-hmm. reality so you have to build characters. It's I think guys learn more from doing shows than girls do because mm-hmm. of the, like if they have to play multiple ro- roles right. compared to mm-hmm. the mass amount of girls that just get mm-hmm. one role each right? and maybe on stage for five to ten minutes if mm-hmm. it's not like a musical. Right. Where the ensemble's on it, maybe every other song. Mm-hmm. But it's very different. Especially, I think guys tend to more stick to the technical side as well. Sure. Because either with set building or designing either the sound or lights, mm-hmm. most that's most of our background. Well, we feel comfortable that way. Y- yeah. You know, it's, it's that kind of place you can still contribute, but you don't have to be out there. Yeah. Right? And make a big mistake that yeah. everybody's going to notice. Like, oh, crap. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I've had my fair share of big mistakes, it's, especially on stage, um, especially when it comes to like drop lines. You're like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> it's, it's my actually it was actually I shouldn't say this because of my <laughs> I made a really really big make, mistake in high school. It became an inside joke for the a remainder of the years I was there. Mm-hmm. I had actually accidentally dropped dropped the f bomb on stage. You were on stage. I was on stage. I didn't say it right. audibly loud enough for the audience to hear it, but my cast members could hear me. Like, Did they react to it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a two-person scene, and my, my partner was like, wait, what was that? <laughs> I was like, oh, crap, that's not the line. 
<laughs> so, so what was what prompted that? You forgot a line, or I completely did something. I completely dropped my character and lo- right. lost my line. Right. So it's like first inclination was to, for some reason, drop the f bomb, but my mind was way more immature back then because it's like around all those in- immature topics and all that stuff. So it's like right out there. I remember watching. Was it? Something like Goodbye Charlie, I can't remember. So this is a professional stage. And it's the drunk scene. Mm-hmm. And the actress lost her contact in her, in her <laughs> glass, martini glass, whatever. And they lost it. Of course, when they lost it and started laughing, the audience lost it. So for about a minute, we're just going back and forth. Okay, we ever going to get back on <laughs> But we were having a great time. And finally she got it. Okay, fine. I don't know what she did with the contact. Yeah. She put it back in her eye, whatever. And then and get on from there. The thing about mistakes, like, you could... Alter them in a way where it fits the stage. Right. If you don't break your character or right. react to it, dropping mm-hmm. it, so the audience is like, "Oh, this is part of the script. It happens." Mm-hmm. They don't know what happens, or they don't know that that was a complete mess up. Right. Of the whole situation, um, but I've also had like my fair share of like technical mistakes because uh, I do I design lights at my right. college also, mm-hmm. and uh, I may have dropped a couple of wrenches from the catwalk. Yeah, that can hurt some people. <laughs> I mean, luckily, like we have the, the bungee connected to our, yes, our belt right. loop, but it's like, oh crap! Because <laughs> <laughs> you're up there, thirty, forty feet yep. in the air, you're like eh, it's dangerous. Yeah, it's very dangerous work, especially if you're not being careful of what's being around you. Right. Um, I had a one time I was at play festival this past March, early March. Um, it was up in Tarleton State University. Yep. Was, that catwalk is really, really sketchy. Like you put your weight on one step, and you can feel the grate go down. You're like, "Oh, that's awful!" Ooh. You're like, <laughs> you're like, "Is this actually safe for me to be on right now?" Because that, that theater is like from the fifties, I think. Or but still, yeah. yeah, it's like I don't want to die right here. It's not worth it, and we have lost friends that way. It's Absolutely. very, it's very dangerous work, especially like, you can also electrocute yourself if you're not careful yeah. enough. Um, mm-hmm. Especially if it's like older uh, lighting equipment that you're using, because mm-hmm. wires can get frayed. Yep, it's just a big hassle and mess that can right. happen. So, so, are you majoring in theater, or are you just doing this for fun? Or um, I've been tossing back and forth between theater and accounting. Um, <laughs> Uh, I like the way you put that. I'm, I'm tossing the back between theater and account. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I could add up a bunch of numbers or that, or I should do something I love. Why can't you do both? I've thought about double bantering in both. It's mm-hmm. just I probably have to go to the accounting route first so I could start saving up money to. Because right. getting a double major is actually expensive in the long run if you yeah. can't get enough financial aid or anything right. coming straight out of your pocket. Right. And I don't want to. Dabble too much into student loans because it's sure it gets understand. it gets expensive real fast. But you know more, better than anyone else. You know, like said, uh, if you decide to do theater professionally, mm-hmm. that it really helps to have another skill. That yeah. you know, yeah, uh, I think the person that's done the best uh, on Broadway that I know is a friend of mine. She's an IT professional, mm-hmm. so that's what she does when she's not getting gigs. Yeah, but if she's done the gigs. At least she's got some you know regular yeah, income. Yeah, it's it's better to have that uh, backup career. Absolutely. So you're like. Oh crap! I can't get any shows or gigs or anything like that. Oh, here's this backup degree I yeah. have. Let's go work in that. Right. But hopefully, you like enjoy doing that as well. Yeah, yeah. Like that's why I'm choosing to go with work because I like yeah. messing with numbers and sure. calculating finances and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. it's something that I've been interested in since junior high. Maybe next thing you know, you're a producer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, this worked out perfectly well. I can put both my degrees together at once. Yeah. So, make keep everything in line. I mean, obviously, you, you said you came originally because you were a singer, mm-hmm. and that's how you got in, into theater. But now that you've been doing it for, for some time, how do you approach a character? Um, now, I actually do research into the character mm-hmm. I'm playing. Um, when I first started out, they're like, here, you're this character, I have a line. I was like, all right. I, I remember yelling this line, very, very monotone, monotone yeah. up until like the... Opening night where people are like, hey, <laughs> why are you so monotone? I'm like, that's just how I felt. Nobody said anything about it till then. Nobody said anything. So I was like, I right. It's, like, it's my first inclination is like just say the line. Yeah, and most people are like, 
you, it comes up with complete monotone because you're trying to control your voice and right. say the right words. People think acting is easy because mm-hmm. we do it in a daily life. Yeah. I think it's completely opposite because you actually have to control so many different uh, uh, elements. Yes. Like your voice, your tone. If your, your character has a certain your position, your I mean everything, yeah, yeah, your your body posture, everything, yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot more to it. You want it to be seem natural, but it's not, it's not natural in a sense because there, there are a lot of things to think about. You yeah, know? I mean, it's like if, if in theater, I mean, yes, we're given blocking, but we don't necessarily hit our marks exactly. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> if you're like nearless marks, you're perfectly fine. It's just, like, yeah, but 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 you've worked quite, so you know that you know. Yeah. That's right for them. So if they don't hit their marks, but yeah. you know, you've set your light in a certain place. Uh, I can't move the light, <laughs> the like, guys. I can't move the light in the middle of the show. I need you to find your spot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's that's one thing that's hard to explain to like new people. You find your center in the light because if you yeah. don't, but even be- yeah, it is kind of an odd thing to explain because it, it sounds obvious. I mean, we have that trouble here. We have people that you know they've never done theater before. Mm-hmm. And then we have people that are professionals. So you have this wide range of, of, of expertise that, you know, hope people will pass on. But you said they're little subtle things. It's the vocabulary for starters, yeah. right? You say, find your light. Well, someone, that might just go over their head. And you're yeah. like, what does that, you know, they won't say anything. But so what What do you want? You know, exactly. And they have that deer in the head, like, look on their face. Like, right. Then you're like, just middle of the circle of light on stage <laughs> where you feel it on your face and your face right. is burning up. That's yeah. when you know you're in, right. in center. Right. Because you don't want it to be, because you, you, if you're not in that center, the light's either going to hit your forehead from there up, or it's going right. to hit you from the chin down. Yeah. So. I guess who gets blamed? Yeah. We, <laughs> we get the blame. Yeah, totally. because we get the blame. We're like, why can't you put The lighting off? sucks. What? what? <laughs> it's like, oh, I can't control where I put the light. Oh, well, we can't control, but we well, can't. Okay, great, but, but if you, you know, what I've done it too, you know what I say? Oh, they keep walking out of the light, so you make it bigger. Yeah. And then they keep moving out of it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, for the past two weeks. Here's the pool. Here's the pool. F- past two weeks, you've moved right here. As soon as I fix it, you move all the way over here. It's like. <sighs> I mean, I understand, you know, you know, when you're on stage and, you know, you're looking for some motivations yeah. for that one. But, you know, when we're tech, yeah. we like things predictable. Yeah. Like, this actress or actor always moves to this, you know, position at this time, you know. <laughs> and that's really comforting for us. Yeah. And when things don't go that way. We get really rattled because really? guess who gets blamed? <laughs> so we get the blame all the time. So it's like, it's like, how can you, uh, why, why do you change your blogging the day we fix your the line to fix to where you're going? Yep. Yeah. No, that it happens all the time. I'm just like, well, can't do anything about it now. <laughs> but um. even so, I think. Sound uh, lights are more forgiving than sound because you know if you start a little off in time, yeah, no big deal. Yeah, sound goes a little off. Oh, guys, everybody notices it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> when a mic doesn't get turned on in a time, like right, you could tell. Oh, that's instant. Yeah. people notice that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Lights don't come on exactly. Eh, make not that big a deal. Depends on the scene. Yeah, or like even like with music fade right. times because yes, you, if you don't get the fade right, right, it'll sound like a sudden stop in the music. Mm-hmm. Or a sudden just start in the music where you just have to fade it in. But mm. most people are, they're pretty forgiving on that also because, but you have to hit for vocalists on stage. Sometimes they have to start the song right then and there. So they kind of hear that very first note to mm-hmm. know to go. Yeah. But, okay. Back <laughs> to go towards the characters. Um, now I, I do a lot of research into my characters because how, would, like, in Legally Blonde, I mm. play a uh, bailiff. Right. How, how does a bailiff stand in the court? You right. want to be upright or right. stern or, right. but most people at first are like, oh, okay, you're just standing there, nothing else. You're like, but you gotta, you gotta make yourself look intimidating. And for me, it's like, I am skinny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm completely skinny. So it's like, well, how do I make this work? All right. Puff out the chest and make yourself yes. look bigger. Mm-hmm. It's just, all these tiny details you have to go out and find yourself right. to help put it, get your character right. Right. So, you know, the interesting thing about this, even though most people don't notice, if you don't get it right or it's not authentic, mm-hmm. they'll they'll know. They, they may not verbalize it that way, but yeah. it, it comes across. Yeah. And, and it hurts the whole production. I mean, people always think, well, it's all about the leads. No, yes, they do have to carry the production. Mm-hmm. But everyone else has to, you know, match that game too. It's like, I've made this, or I've, 
in my head, mental note, I've made the connection between something I've been taught in choir and yes. to theater is in choir, you're only as strong as your weakest voice. Mm-hmm. Well, in theater, you're as strong as your well, like weakest person. Right. And I don't mean to sound that as and condescending or anything. It's just no, it's true. It's, it's absolutely true because everyone has to be giving either the all with their yes. energy, character just development, or whatnot, or a show's going to fall completely flat mm-hmm. because. It gives it the richness, you know. Yeah, it's the, the tapestry yeah. uh, that makes a really good production. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you your leads need to be good, but that's not everything. The, the supporting cast needs to be equally as good. Like it's like a pyramid. You you want to build on your bottom tiers, your ensemble, because mm-hmm. that's what holds up the show. Mm-hmm. And then you add the supporting roles, and the, mm-hmm. the leads are kind of like the sugar on top, because mm-hmm. it's just like here we are, we're here to right. do our thing, but. People realize the leads won't be where they're at without the ensemble backing them Absolutely. up to get to where they have to be. Because without an ensemble, you get a couple of pretty voices, and that's mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. Just nothing other than that. And you got to be pretty compelling, <laughs> you know. That's what you know. When I listen to the most music, the, the subtle part is I don't realize that most of it there's all backup. There's mm-hmm. backup singers and you know, not all the time, yeah. but a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with either on stage production too. You need that, you know, and it's, to work. And it's a good. That's good that you make that analogy because if you take out the ba- backing vocals or instruments, yes. a lot of modern day songs don't sound good. Just no, they don't. That one voice. It's because I'm sure you've tried it too, right? You tried this song. You say, I really like this song. You try saying it doesn't sound the same. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. Once you do an acapella, it does yeah. not sound good at all. You're like, what? And then I've done it before, like sing a song a cappella and then add right. the backing instruments backwards. Right. And it sounds at least 10 times, if not Absolutely. 100 times more better. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you really can't, you can have a good voice, but it won't come across as good if you don't have that backing mm-hmm. parts to it. So it's a little give and take. Yeah. So that's why you don't really see that many a cappella songs in Broadway shows or even no. any musicals. Because. <laughs> no. It's not that appetizing. No, no. What what show are you most proud of from a lighting design perspective? The shows I've done. Yes, uh, I've only designed two shows so far. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, no, I've designed three shows. I think the the one I was most proud of actually mm-hmm. was when I designed my own Legally Blonde because mm-hmm. I learned a lot through that process because I only had. A few days Mm -hmm. from the time they moved into the theater, which Mm -hmm. luckily the theater they moved on was my college's theater. Right. So from that Sunday, and they opened, I want to say it was a Thursday night. Mm -hmm. From that Sunday to Thursday night, I had to plug in every single cue. Wait a minute. So it wasn't really your production, but you were got responsible for sound lights. Well, I got pulled in um, by the the director to come help out with that show because I knew some of the people in there. Right. And... Because since they knew it was being done at my college, right. I already had prior... You know the equipment. Yeah, I knew the that, equipment. Yeah. You know we got it available, some of that. Yeah. You know the space. Yeah. Um, so and I got to learn how to use uh, intelligent lighting because mm-hmm. I didn't know we had intelligent lighting at the time because it was my second show. Mm-hmm. And the first one was very... It was a straight play, so yeah. I didn't use any intelligence right. or even LEDs at the time because right. it was just mm-hmm. um, normal stage lights. But... I get to learn how to use all, all, like intelligence and incorporating all the bulldogs, and especially because it's different f- from doing lighting a musical than mm-hmm. a straight play. Mm-hmm. Because you incorporate like spotlights and all this stuff, right. but it was a challenge because uh, the director was also wanting to change everything at the time from what I had already pre-planned because I I had no idea what their set pieces were going to be. At, in the right. first place either. Right. So my brought my mind was like, all right, generalization staging was there. Let's right. light up that area. Right. So I'll move it to the other side of the stage before I even knew it. Right. So, but it's funny because the other two shows I got awards for at our play right. festival because right. um, it's, it's a lot of challenge with designing, especially if you're transitioning from your main theater mm-hmm. to a secondary theater you've never been at, and mm-hmm. you only have the blueprints to where the lighting equipment or their dimmer numbers are at. So you're like, well, I can only do so much. Let's hope this fits together in the end process. So, mm-hmm. 
you know, when we did competition, when we were doing it at uh, Quad C or at Community College, mm-hmm. I know why people do very simple type tech shows when they go to competition because yeah. you just don't know what you're going to get that, when you go. That's completely true. Um, and you have limited time. Right. Yeah, we had, I think it was an hour and 45 minutes right. to hang up any additional line that you brought with you. Right. Plug in all your cues, uh, fix any uh, focusing issues right. with the. the that's dis- nothing, and and, and and you know for tech, you know prep yeah. time. That's nothing. <laughs> yeah, like people and people think like, oh, you have that two hours. You're like two hours, you could burn that up trying to get one light to work. <laughs> and that well, another like big accomplishment I had is like when we went to Tarleton. Yeah, I had let's see, I had the two window gobos. Some LEDs. I think five additional yeah. lighting. I got that all up in like forty-ish minutes. Yeah. Then I had to go plug in all my cues, and I was done within an hour and thirty. Wow! Luckily, but that's a that's like running and yeah. Sometimes you're not a little, you're not watching out for your safety, but that's the number one thing you need to watch out is for your safety because you take that one misstep off the catwalk, that's done. You're toast. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's I, it. I've heard so many stories of people just kicking it right there because they wow. missed up on the catwalk, but it's the dangerous side of tech, especially mm-hmm. lighting, because um, sometimes they either won't support your weight. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not that heavy. <laughs> I was like, I weigh 130, 135. <laughs> and It's not too much to ask. No, it, when I felt that like, great, like starting to cave yep. in under me, I was like... I don't know how they do it. Mm. You no, know, the big thing they seem to do in a lot of the shows I've seen on Broadway, but they're trying to incorporate not even video, but it's almost like three D kind of stuff, holographic. Yeah. Have you seen that? I have that not does? seen any of the. I've, I've seen or like putting you know, like images on, you know, wrapping it around things on stage. I haven't or seen any of those yet. Yeah. Um, because I tend to, I don't get to watch that many recordings of Broadway shows mm-hmm. or any shows in general, but I try to like take lessons from mm. I've seen a lot of like video protections though, mm. like um, either protecting video on top uh, into a uh, uh, screen. Yeah. I uh, mean like as a, as a backdrop or yeah. yeah, it's like, and I've seen some like really good integrations with that. And I've also seen some really, really bad integrations of that because it's like, especially if it's like an old style show mm-hmm. and then they add that you're like, it t- kind of takes you out of the imagination spectrum that right. a uh, show is supposed to give you. And you're like, well, I'm focusing on the protection yeah. more than I am focusing on the characters. Right. It, and that's a hard uh, call to, you know, like I said, uh, tech, anytime you've got tech, right? Mm-hmm. Are you using the tech just because you can? Mm-hmm. Or does it really make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I don't like to use a lot of spotlights yeah. because I feel like. Particularly, some scenes do call for the spotlight, right. but there's some those little tiny scenes, like well, the spotlight's not needed. You mm. can see the one person mm. on perfectly fine. It's just I've had times where it's this, just the spotlight takes me out of the scene because it's like, mm. well, you just broke the fourth wall unintentionally, mm. and in a show that doesn't break the fourth wall, you're like, why is that even there? Or intentionally. Yeah. And most of that is, it's, it's, like, it's not an unintentional thing. Yeah. It's intentional, right? Yeah. It's yeah. just really weird to see all that stuff. And it doesn't, sometimes it just doesn't fit. Yeah. Well, you know, that's an interesting uh, 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 note because, you know, you've, we've talked about tech breaking the yeah. fourth wall. Um, but, you know, that can also come across through characterization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How you, you, you pick your characterization. You know, the, you know, when we were first starting uh, acting and they always talk about, you know, like, you know, uh, what is it? Working the obstacle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, okay, you know, you want to be authentic, but let's not push it too far. And yeah. that's, but that's your per characterization. Yeah. You know? Going back to like the Leaving Iowa show where I played the uh, Confederate war yeah. or reenactment of a Confederate war leader. Uh, I actually broke the fourth wall with the character because. Right. One of the main characters goes out and sits in the audience, and I'm always I'm asking for volunteers to help with mm-hmm. the reenactment. Right, it's audience little re- reenaction. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the audience doesn't catch on to when they're actually being played to. So I had one time where actually one of my closest friends is in the audience is like, right. "Pick me, pick me." I'm like, 
try not to break character right now from laughing because right. first time someone's actually interacting with an audience interactive piece hmm. besides the main characters. The show shows that they're into that, right? Yeah. In fact, that, that's just part of it. It's not just interaction, but you you are intentionally breaking. Yeah. Control. Well, it can make sense. Yeah. You know, sometimes it can be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a lot of comedies do that. Yeah. Which is good for comedies. Yeah. So what are the things you want to do in theater that you haven't done yet? I'm trying to think of things I haven't done. <laughs> I've designed sound. I've directed. Mm-hmm. I've done lights. You built set? I, built set. I awesome. actually, funny story, uh, when I did Sweeney Todd, we had to build our set from the scra- from scratch yeah. up because we thought we had to do it off campus because mm-hmm. it was done with the music department, not the drama department. Right. So we're building the set up get everything set and ready to go our the manager of the the performing arts center is like you can't do that that's that building's not safe like what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> we're like there's guidelines to how we're like yeah the the three quarter inch screws are too short you need to be using like the or like these long the star bit screws are like right. okay and the way how we did the, the track shoot was not safe at all. Right. You literally had maybe a, f- I want to say about three feet of slide, and right. then you had to like quickly go down a slide that was in the opposite direction. I've had many sh- shows during that time where I hit my head going down the the slide Ooh. because you just slide down, but and if you're not careful, you hit your head right then, Ugh. and I got a concussion a couple of times because of it. So, but that show was. A hot mess, in the sense. Well, it's, it's an interesting show. Did, did you see the? I guess they had a, a recent, re, I don't say real recent uh, revival on TV. But um, did the, they do it modern modern style or what is it? The, the, the film adaptation. The film. The, the film, film version, adaptation yes. of Johnny Depp. Yeah, yes. we we actually a lot of us watched that for a character basis because the film ad- adaptation was not too far from the actual script. Uh-huh. Besides some musical music, right? I watched the. And it was that's what got me into Sweeney Todd in the first place was the actual film. Right. So I was like, oh, cool, I want to do that. And then when audition came really, really close to Anthony, but that's like I think it's the worst thing when directors tell you you're like you were this close to being the role you wanted, but someone else just like kicks you out of your little <laughs> spot. And you're like, what? <laughs> well then. It hurts any which way. And like I said, you, you direct this, so you've been in a spot where you've had to cast. Yeah, but it's very. Di- it is a different perspective from the director versus uh, be, being the actor. And yeah. in the director's director's perspective, it's really hard not to precast. Mm-hmm. You got to keep yourself open to who mm-hmm. walks in to audition. Yes, and it it was like it was a student student uh, student directed shows mm-hmm. where your group of people right. come and audition for your shows. Right. So you knew every single person that was coming. You know in. what they're good at. You know where they could fit. Stuff like that. So you're like, yes. I need to cast this unbiasedly, just just to how they audition. But in the back of your head, you're like, well, I know they work well with angry characters or the antagonist or. Right. Well, let's talk about that because that's that's a big deal, especially in, in community theater. <laughs> um, well, most people don't like the precasting. I get it. Yeah, I don't like it either. But mm-hmm. you're right. There is this uh, tendency to go with who you know. Yeah, precasting is pretty. It's like one of those subjects I don't really like because you're always like so dead set on like, I'm going to have this person play the lead role. Right. Especially in community theater, that's like not really the greatest thing to do because you don't know who will walk in those doors and blow your mind away, but mm-hmm. you're still like, oh, I just want this person. Mm-hmm. Then you have in the back of your head, like, because I, from being a perspective of a cast member, I've seen people like, well, this person did so much better in their auditions. And fit the character so much better, then why is this person the character they sh- the right character person A should have been? And they're like, well, that, that starts gossip that doesn't necessarily need to be talked about mm-hmm. during a show because that just causes so much different tension that really does not belong in the environment and just right. causes. Dis- it's hard. It, it, it's it's hard, and uh, yeah. you, you try to be fair to, to folks, but it, it's it's except from the actor's perspective, especially if you've been at auditions and you see somebody that gets the role, they didn't even show up at auditions. 
or at least that you know of. Yeah. Right? And yeah. you're like, wait a minute, what, what, what's going on there? But we see it happen all, uh, well, all the time, all over the place. Yeah. And that's the thing, especially like, if they don't pay attention to, like, certain, certain theater groups, it's like, because I, from what I did research on stage right, yeah, they hold, every most theater groups hold that clause. Like, if no one auditions that fits the role, mm. we have we reserve the right to pull in who we feel like bringing in. And, and if you're a director, you want the right role because you know if you don't get casting right, mm. you just got trouble from then on out. Yeah, know? if you don't have like that that clause, that, right? And most people don't know of that clause, mm. so it's like, well, this cat role is to be determined. What does it take for me to get it? Right. Well, the director already has already decided you don't fit that role. Right. So, right or wrong, that you know, it's their vision, and yeah. then, you know, there's this line between director has it has to be their vision, mm-hmm. right? You need someone, you need one captain, their their vision, right or wrong, mm-hmm. but it is their vision, and, and then they go from there. When you were director and you were you like the, the the vision, and you obviously you've played all these different roles, so you're cognizant of that. You know mm-hmm. how, how how people feel. How do you feel when you had to tell people, "Sorry, you didn't get"? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily. um we didn't really have people complain about their casting. Yeah. Um, we had one, but we're like, I'm sorry, you just don't, you didn't fit the, what we wanted. Right. Cause it was a, uh, the, there was a, a gay cheerleader in the show that we had to cast a male as. Right. Well, he's, he's there was, the cheerleader was supposed to be masculine. Right. Some people were playing it very flamboyantly. Right. Which is not what we wanted. wanted right. Because. Did you tell them that? We told him, like, you played it very, very flamboyantly. Right. And the person that we casted played it almost exactly how we wanted to play. Mm. So there's, and it's harder to tell that to people that you're close to. Yes, it is. Because it's like, well, I'm, I know what you're capable of, but someone else right. did it better than you. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to use the words, did it better than you, but at the same time, you need to use the words, did it did it better than you you know there, there, i guess there are a lot of uh, places in life uh it, it, forget theater where being honest with some it hurts right? yeah especially if you're close to it but you know you want to tell you, you need to communicate that somehow because you, you mean well hopefully you, you mean well but it really hurts in theater because we put our hearts out there right, right. we just put it out on the line right. like, uh, i'm sorry you weren't good enough we don't say it that way you don't yeah. it's like it's like ouch you just didn't fit the role <laughs> but it's like in theater, most people are giving it like 150%, even oh, yeah. 200%. Right. And when they're told they're, they didn't, they're not good enough, they're like, well, then they start second guessing themselves and right. their confidence goes down. But it's hard. It, 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 it's really hard because it can really be hard. You yeah. Know. <laughs> like you said, you've sat on both sides of the, you know, mm-hmm. I've sat on both sides. And it's still hard. Yeah. It's, it's like, like oh. it's hard. Especially like getting cast numer- like over and over again as yeah. ensembles, you're like, yeah. maybe I'm not good enough to be a supporting role or lead role, or like, right. and your confidence will slowly get down. But then there's that one time you get the a really big supporting role or lead mm-hmm. role where it, suddenly your confidence goes to the roof because you finally got to that point, and it's happened. It ha- it's happened to me. And it's happened to ever a lot of people I know. Mm-hmm. Like Austin, he was. He did not expect to get Emmett. He's awesome. Yeah, he he's and you need to get him here. He won't do an interview yet. <laughs> what's, what's the deal? <laughs> Come on, I'll, I'll, I'll text him after this. But <laughs> fix it. Yeah, fix yeah. that, will you? <laughs> like he he's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, like his acting, his voice. So, he, yeah, it's amazing. I I've told him this several times, but right. he, he just doesn't believe it. Yeah. And when he told me, he like when he got saw that he got Emmett, he was like he was flabbergasted because he thought. People were so much better than him, but it's like I thought you. He had the right look. He's got the right yeah. sound, you know. And uh, I was I to tell somebody, you know, I was driving to Dallas yesterday, yeah. And I turned on uh, Pandora and I put on Legally Blonde the musical, the Broadway version, yeah. And I turned it off in one minute because because our version was better. Yeah, that's, that's like, I couldn't take it anymore. It's just like our version's better. <laughs> <Turn> it <on. laughs> I, I do that because I still I listen to the soundtrack every day. Yeah. Not, not out of necessity because I'm right. in the show. It's right. just I like the music. Sure, it's great energy, high energy music. It's yeah. like, and it's weird because I've never done this with the show before. I'm actually, I get, I get bored halfway during musical that I'm doing right. because either it's like old timey musicals, right, or it's just, it just I don't like the style. But mm-hmm. Legally Bond is so high pace and mm-hmm. high energy mm-hmm. that you can't help but not get involved with it, right. 
I have a difference as, as, as um, I look at plays or musicals differently depending whether I'm watching it, mm-hmm. and I don't mean passively, but or actually doing it. Mm-hmm. We've seen it and we've enjoyed it, but it seems like when you do it, there's there's more. You've got obviously more invested, but it, it, it takes on a different tone. I don't know what yeah. it is. It's just I don't know what it is either. Like there's times I've watched shows and I'm like, well, wow, this sucks, and it's. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I, I don't mean to, to be harsh. No, 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 no. But you're like, once you, like, you're just like expecting so much more, especially with a show you've already done before. You're like, right. like all right, I, wa- I want them to blow me away compared to like what I'm used to. And then you're like, right. well. It's a hazard of being in theater because we are so critical when we go. I mean, obviously we're there to support our friends. Yeah, but like you're that. super. But when you're always, you're always looking at from these multiple perspectives, right? Like if I were doing the show, how would I do it differently? Yeah. Or like, ooh, that was a really interesting choice. Or, yeah. that's an interesting choice, but I'm not going to do it that way. <laughs> or, that sucked, I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's like the whole super critical side right. comes out even more if like, like your really close friends or such mm-hmm. are in that show. You're like, you're watching their little things of what they're doing and you're like, right. and then because you know they're going to ask you your critiques as soon as you right. they get off that stage. But you you also want to be like watering it down because you're like, if you come off too harsh right they're gonna come off really not ready mm. like i did that this past week when i went to go watch a couple of a uh, tech rehearsal oh. so bear in mind it was a tech rehearsal of so course yeah first day with the orchestra so it's like okay i'm not gonna be too critical but at the same time you're just like watching every little detail right and i guess it's because of this show where the ensemble, especially in the dance numbers, were like actually a big part. I was yeah. like paying attention to every single person in like the big ensemble numbers right. through the choreography, and I noticed people that were either under underperforming or right. under energetic. You're like, and especially if it's a friend, you're like, hey, just put a smile on your face. <laughs> Look like you're having fun. It makes a difference. It makes a whole lot of difference, even if you're. Just like put it on this like big boisterous smile. You're like, okay, mm-hmm. people, people like just to see you smiling, and having fun on stage. But I've also saw people that were like over overdoing it. You're like, mm-hmm. break it down a little, because you can overact as much as you want, but there it has to be that median. Because if you're overreacting, especially in musical numbers. You're going to have your attention drawn to you, which not necessarily is a bad thing. Right. But when it's like, it's the time for the leads to right. have their thing, it's, you need to have their attention focused on the leads because mm. it could be a hot, heartfelt sonnet that's being sang right, right now. But if you're like sitting there, like big smile, like doing a lot of movements, you're like, you need to tone it down just a tiny bit. But I guess that comes in a college. Where you're just like trying to be noticed by the director mm-hmm. for like future roles, but right. sometimes you gotta just lay low, keep calm mm-hmm. because you never know what's gonna happen. Well, it's back to the good of the production. Yeah, yeah. what is the best for the good of the production? Mm-hmm. And it is so hard because people are trying to do. But you know, we have our own egos that we have to deal with. Yeah, right? it's, it's like why didn't you know? Do I need to do this or not? You know, can I contribute in this way or not? And yeah. it, and you can do that by making your character as authentic as possible and fit in the moment. Uh, but that's for different for each person. Some people think, oh, no, it needs to be bigger. And I guess at the end of the day, you know, as a director, well, you've saw that too. Yeah. When, how far do you like your characters to go? Like during, you know, there's the rehearsal versus the thing. How much do you like to play during rehearsals, kind of finding the characters? I, I try to let the the cast members do their own thing, but mm-hmm. I'm like also just like, hey, maybe you should try this out yeah. or try this out. Mm-hmm. Or tell me if your character would do this thing versus... Mm. B because you, because cast members need to have that freedom to find what's comfortable for them. Right. B- because I've been in productions where I've been told every little thing to do, and I'm like, you need line readings basically. I'm reading, I'm reading my <laughs> line and moving with my blocking. I'm like, this is, I can't right. get into the role right. because I have no freedom at all. Mm. So I've always kept that in mind whenever I direct. Yeah. Because. It's really the person's outcome, the end goal, the character, how they're producing. Because right. 
Well, that I think that also helps too if you get strong actors that can develop the role. Mm-hmm. What I call thinking actors. Yeah. When you you know it seems like when you move more into the film. Uh, I mean, certainly there's plenty of good thinking actors, but then there are plenty of people that make uh, their living by t- doing exactly what the director says. Mm-hmm. We had a guy that had a resume like you wouldn't believe. Mm-hmm. And when he got on stage, I couldn't believe that resume. I'm looking at the resume and him like, these two don't seem to add up. And the reason he wasn't a thinking actor. Yeah. If, but if you told him exactly what you wanted, bam, you got it. Yeah. But like, he couldn't come up with that himself. Yeah. It's just that whole perspective because... It's better on stage to have that thing in personality where you can yes. do it just, that makes the rehearsal process go oh, so, so much easier. smoother. So much funner. And yeah, you know. Because you can actually have fun. Now you're creating something collaboratively. Yeah. You know, it's, yes, there you have to have a director's vision, but now we're all working together to make this one vision come about. You and, know? and from another director's perspective, like like on the topic of egos that you just yeah. said, you're going to also be able to control your actor's egos. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds like a really ridiculous thing to do, but... You have these personalities with egos that are like the science science of a Goodyear blimp. You're like, <laughs> you're like, you need to deflate your ego just a little bit because I've been I've been in very a lot of productions where like, especially like in the t- terms understudies like yeah. understudies like well maybe I should have more shows oh, right, because right. I I could do it so much better. I'm like, there's a reason why you're the understudy. Versus the actual main character yeah. or the main actress or yeah. actor for that character because... The no, for, yeah, whatever yeah. reason, yeah. But, but interesting, you know, I was talking about that too. Uh, when we went on Honeymoon, the, mm-hmm. the story, uh, we went to London mm-hmm. and they gave us tickets to 42nd Street. I'm going, 42nd Street? I could see that in the States. I really don't want to see it, you know. Yeah. So they gave us pretty nice seats, the seventh row. Yeah. And... It was an understudy's performance because the lead had gotten pregnant. And mm-hmm. so the understudy took over. Mm-hmm. Understudy was all of 18 by the name of Catherine Zeta Jones. Okay. <laughs> Never even, heard, you know, nobody had heard. But yeah. it was such an odd name. Yeah. It stuck with us. We even saw her in the underground later on. Yeah. Of course, later on, she does Chicago. And it yeah. was, I didn't know she could sing and dance. I already knew that. Been there, done that. Yeah. And she was awesome. Yeah. She was real thin. She, she just blew you away. Yeah. As Peggy Sawyer. So sometimes, you know, th- those things also, you know, have to, you just need the right time and you know, work out. Yeah, people, hopefully, they get yeah. their time in the sun and it works out. And it really does work out in the end if you just keep in it long enough. Yeah. Because yeah, you could have built that experience. Mm-hmm. And like going back to the whole precasting situation, connections also do help a lot. It's, it's a people business. It's, it, it really is. Like, you build those connections, you get to know mm-hmm. the people out there, and they know what you're capable of. Because mm-hmm. you can completely bomb an audition and just do... Horrible. Some people don't do well at auditions. Some they just don't. I don't know what it is, you know, or maybe you're just off that night for whatever, for whatever reason. But So in that case, yes, it does help to know yeah, c- what the person's capable of, you know? Especially if the director's, like, the directing team knows what you're capable of, especially yeah. if you worked the past productions with them, mm-hmm. so they can know... To your limits, or even like musicals, your vocal range. Yeah. Because you could choose an audition song that doesn't display your range. Exactly. When, when you've got an actor that's having trouble with the right motivation, right characterization, or whatever, how do you help to motivate them? Um, I Or inspiration, whatever. whatever. They usually do, like one of the first rehearsals is like a table session where mm-hmm. we talk about characters. And what, sure. and at first, at first, I'll write down a list of things for each character of what I I envision. Sure. But at first, I'll ask the, the actors and actresses what they see in that character. Mm-hmm. If I, I see something that co- like differentiate differentiates from what I have, I'm like, yeah. so how did you come to this conclusion? Mm-hmm. And they're like, I don't know. I just felt this way. And and then I'll just start like feeding them to help build more mm-hmm. and more. Because, well, yes, it's good to give them the freedom. If it starts to go two ways from what you see, right? It's it, it's still your vision that yeah. has to, you know, yeah, because you're responsible at the end of the day for this yeah. production. Yeah, it's your vision. They're going to go like, what happened there? Yeah, <laughs> I saw your play. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> it's different too, because especially in the areas you're giving them, because you also have to cut back either the topics that are being said, especially like a really conservative area. You have to. Really watch out what you're writing. Be, or Yeah, that we it, do here. It's different. It's And you have to know your audience. That's, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. It, that's all the theater is, is, knowing your audience. Like in Broadway, you could get away with so much because it's Broadway. Yeah. They're not going to question anything. 
but in like in, in a tiny community theater or a community college, they're like, well, this does not agree with my ideologies. I'm gonna write an angry, angry rants on Facebook or yeah. We do a lot of entertainment, and mm-hmm. that's it is that. But it can also be educational. But yeah. when you're educational, you have to be really careful how you approach that. Yeah, you know, and, and everyone needs a little different touch. Yeah, you can still get your message across. You just gotta figure out how to do that message. Like, how, how how do I do this smoothly and easily yeah. without going way overboard with this? Yeah. But that's just the, the, and entertainment is just the number one quarter you want to go for. It. You want to make sure your audience is having a good time and enjoying what they're. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've got friends too that they they view theater pretty much from a much more hardcore perspective, mm-hmm. which are like I've got a certain message I'm trying to get across yeah. and some of that. So what what kind of plays do they write or roles yeah. that they tend to go for? And, and you see that way. And how do I guess how do you pro, I mean, where do they find the proper venues? What type of message type play uh, productions? I think that just has to come down to research, mm-hmm. knowing the area that that theater is around, mm-hmm. or even the show itself. Because you can't let's see what's let's get an example. Avenue Q is let's go yes, with Avenue. Avenue Q, okay. The full gra- vulgarity and the undertone that's in Avenue right. Q, you can't go and do it in what's a good like a really conservative area. There's a lot of places. I'm not even sure we could do it here. No, um, the, you know, like I said, the same thing can be said for uh, extremities. It could be. I mean, there's a lot of you know yeah. uh, plays, but there's nothing necessarily wrong. Yeah, with them, it's just. You can't. Your audience won't accept that. Or even like the Book of Mormon. I don't yep. think you could do that here. Or probably any, not in this area because no, probably not. People don't understand that a lot of theater is satire, mm-hmm. making fun of what they have. It's yes. not. It's not meant to offend people. It's just th- like entertainment. Yeah. Well, it's also maybe you can make sometimes that's a way of getting people to think about it yeah. from a satirical point of view. Yeah. But unfortunately, here it doesn't. It no. doesn't translate very well. It's just it's the way it is. Because uh, most people way. in the audience will take this super seriously. They're like, "Okay, okay, oh cool," but it's like we want more than that. We want you to be like getting fall for the characters. That's what our jobs yep. as actors is to is to make you fit into the characters and all, mm-hmm. or connect to the characters and like connect into yourself. Yeah. And that's like a good, a good and a really good production. So will help you connect to either this character or this character. Or any character. I, I think that you know, like I said, like I said, we, from an entertainment perspective, if we get that, that's great. But sometimes, if we can inspire someone to change, mm-hmm. however we do that, that's a good thing. And it doesn't have to be hitting somebody over the head. With, yeah, this is my message. Yeah, right. But if we can still inspire them to change, we've done our job. And that's how like. I don't want to say good or bad audience member, but a good audience member will actually go there and take something away right. from the production. Segue so toward the kind of the next topic, which has to do with entertainment in general, whether it's our phone, our TV, Netflix, whatever. Yeah. What is it that we're getting? Is this just to decompress? A lot of that is just that. We're yeah. just there to decompress, yeah. right? I'm tired, uh, whatever, exhausted. Uh, you know, I had a bad day, and I don't want to think about that. And so there's you know other ways we want to mm-hmm. just enjoy ourselves. It's like all those different entertainment topics are good, like especially for me. I tend to use it for stress relief right because work school sure. all this stuff you tend to build up a bunch of stress you're like okay i'm gonna do this mm. like i'm gonna bring this up because it just came out a few days ago pokemon right. go yes that's a big <laughs> deal right right it's, now it's a big deal with it, i think it's an awesome game but now look at people have perverted it right yeah right, you know oh guess what if i lay in wait because yeah. i know people can come here i can rob them yeah <laughs> <laughs> like just use that to rob people i'm like Okay, I'm not going to go out at night in the middle of the night to go do this. It's just like, why? It's, people ex- will find some ways to exploit that. But it's like, I go out there. It's a good way to reconnect to my childhood. Sure. It's a lot of people in my generation. It's like Pokemon. Grew, they grew up with Pokemon yeah, in that generation. Yeah. Even the generation under us. Even yeah. the generation above me yeah. that got to watch the like, kids right. grow up with this. So it's like it's connecting all these. It's reconnect all these generations again. Because mm-hmm. go to, if you go around, you could find people doing it everywhere. Like mm-hmm. the other night, me and Caleb, we walked yeah. around before a call, right? Going to all these different stops or gyms, right? And we were we were ran into a group of like fifteen people right there in front of the courthouse. We're like, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> what? We were not expecting, right? And it's just like everyone just 
and there was no tensions. Mm-hmm. Everyone just got along with each other. It's just mm-hmm. weird to see the commodity, uh, commodity, considering like 2016 yeah. and all the conflicts that's going right. on everywhere in the country or even the world. Yeah. You're like, there's just this game that's just reconnecting everyone, uniting a lot of folks. So that, that I think it's great from that perspective. That is, you know, giving us this common, just shared experiences, and we need more of those shared experiences so that we can, you know, be past our differences. You know what? We can yeah. still share this game together. Yeah. yeah. Right? And it's and the same thing with like TV shows. Yes, you watch the same show. You're like, right. cool. And you start. You can start friendships. Mm-hmm. You can start many things of just discussions, philosophy, whatever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because it, it starts broadening like the topic subjects. You're like, okay, I'm. This is mm-hmm. interesting. I guess books is where it's, mm-hmm. that's. I don't like saying this, but books are kind of dying out because you have television, you mm-hmm. have iPods, right. All this technology is kind of pushing it to the side, but it's like books are a good way to th- – because I think books help you broaden your imagination. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because with like film or even theater in that aspect, you have someone portraying the character, not really giving you the freedom to build this character. Well, in books, right. you're, you're reading along with their adventures. You're mm-hmm. like – a lot of times you, you imagine yourself as that character and the looks and stuff. It doesn't go right. into like the descriptions, but mm-hmm. you get, you get so much more freedom and that's a good, good topic starter. And like now, especially back in the day before iPods got big or radio, yeah. radio plays. I mean, in the sense it's, it's like a book because yeah. you have to imagine everything. You don't get to see anything. Yeah. You know, it's all, it's all in your head. So I, I, I kind of miss those days when you have, uh, get to use a lot of that imagination, but you know, at the end of the day, a lot of good theater back to writing. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, yes, we, you, we're gonna we're going to make it come to life by putting all these interesting visual effects and props and stuff. But at yeah. the end of the day, it's back to writing. We got to have good writing, you know. And that's why I why reality TV for me, I, I just I can't get into it. Yeah, I can understand sometimes. Yeah, okay, this is kind of interesting. You know, especially because I read a lot of comic books. Yeah. And I like watching adaptations of like the comic books and mm-hmm. because they have good writing. Even though people are like, "Oh, it's just a bunch of pictures," you're like, mm. uh, <laughs> "You missed a, if that's all you see, you missed a lot. <laughs> you missed a lot if you're just going like that. It's just a bunch of pictures. Like, right. it's just so much more depth if you actually like look at it and take mm-hmm. the time to read it. But it, as funny as you mentioned, because I don't really like reality TV either. Mm-hmm. Like. I've watched a couple of seasons in Big Brother, and yeah. there's times like I I get really into the seasons, right? Because there's like you find those people that you can connect to, right? But there's other seasons you're like, this is really really boring. Why do I, <laughs> why do I like this? <laughs> and then you try to get the next year, you're like, oh okay, this is why I liked it. But it's the same thing like Survivor, because mm-hmm. Survivor's different because it's it's also like. Like these are also competition shows, right? And like Survivor, you're actually trying to survive and mm-hmm. all this stuff. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of back background mm-hmm. stay stuff you don't mm-hmm. know. Like they know the, they're not gonna let their people starve to death, right? All that stuff. You know they have mer- emergency rations. Well, that's the thing. You know, like I said you know these so-called reality shows <laughs> is uh, that there's always these little backstops, yeah. right? And then well, we used to like uh, storage wars. You know, yeah. it's like, ooh, what are they going to find, you know, in there? And then we find out, oh, they actually put some in some yeah. of these things. Like, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's like these expe- expensive things are plants. They like, yeah. you know, they know that's going to be there. And that's why do you think when they get to those uh, storage units, why do you think they're always just like focused on the, the four or five characters that are just constantly like bidding all their money on it? Right. Which most of that money is actually just handed to them by the producers because it's like well here you go this lot and then they like slowly tax up the value like so you're telling me you got like twenty thousand dollars off this unit you bought for 150 bucks come on that's especially since you like you don't they don't the whole they don't get to check out everything Mm -hmm. It's so it's like they could close it down, but the producers at then could go in and hide stuff underneath like the boxes, 
mm-hmm. or in the boxes. Uh, it was a couple of years ago, like Magic the Gathering cards were found. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know what they are, right. you don't know the value of them. Like there's like cards are worth tens of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. And so this one card so happened to be found a lot. Well, there's no other cards in the lot. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a little fishy. <laughs> It's like, it just happens to be this card. It's like, it's just like, well, well, why can I get lucky like that? But it's like, the whole because it's not luck. It's not. It's been planned. It's planted. And it's, it's, yeah, I mean, we didn't learn anything from quiz show. I mean, come on, <laughs> you know what? Five, six, seven decades ago, and yeah. we're still fixing yeah. shows. Yeah, and it's like back on the topic, like Big Brother and Survivor. Yeah. Most of the time, they don't realize the winner is almost predetermined. Like, yes, they have those challenges and whatnot, right, right. but it's almost predetermined. To, like, they cast it in a certain way for a certain pe- people to person to win. Yeah, and people don't realize like when you lose on those shows, you do not get nothing. They do compensate you. Oh, I'm sure you they, can compensate. They, yes. they compensate you nicely, especially yeah. especially in Survivor. You really like seriously hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. In the long run, and that's why they keep bringing back the same people over and over again. <laughs> if if you don't pay attention to that, they do. But it's reality TV is just bogus. Mm-hmm. It, but it's cheap. That's the problem. You know, it, it's yeah. cheap to make. Why? Because I don't have to write a script. Yeah, it's cheap to make, and we can make billions of dollars off of it. Yep. Why do you think Jersey Shore lasted for so long? <laughs> that show was absolutely horrible. <laughs> it's like. You got Snooky and all this stuff like peak like young adults partying twenty four seven. How is this good TV? Yeah, oh, they're getting into a fist fight. <laughs> it's like, why? So when you're not doing theater, what do you do? Um I play Magic the Gathering, the card game. Okay. Um I go around traveling, playing in tournaments across the state. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um It was hardcore here. <laughs> <laughs> it's hardcore until you see like how much it hits my bank account. You're like, maybe I should calm down just a little. As long as you could afford it, hey, yeah, it's okay. If you, can, <laughs> if you can afford it, but it's like, don't put yourself in the crippling debt. Right. Just to pl- go around doing. But I, other than that, I tend to just like stay at home writing music and playing games. Writing music. So what style of music are you? Um, uh, I'm more like punk rock. <laughs> really? Okay. Uh, I try building around those harmonies and. Mm-hmm. And I kind of use those same tones like other big bands in that genre. Mm-hmm. And I incorporate to that my own yep. songwriting. And so it's like, yeah. oh, let's let's see what I could do. And a lot of times it's my own original lyrics that just happen to pop in my head at that time. I write it down. I'm like, oh, this is actually good. <laughs> <laughs> now the next challenge is finding like the melodies and all that right. stuff. And so it's really interesting uh, cons- like challenge in the time it takes. Right. But. So do you write for you? Do you write because it's cathartic or do you write because you I'd like to perform it sometime at a bar or whatever? I, I like, I write for myself. Yeah. Um, not a lot of people have seen my the stuff right. I've written because it helps like, especially like get, get a little depressing times. You're like, okay, sure. this helps write right. out all your issues or mm-hmm. sure. when you're really happy, you're like, let's write this down yeah. so I can look at this later and be like, oh, I remember this. And it helps. It's your version of a diary. It just happens to be musical. Yeah. It's. And it's like, it's calming in a right. sense mm-hmm. to other people. It may not be calming because it's like, what's going on? I'm like, yeah. But it's your experience, yeah. And that's just a way of your uh, your communicating, you know, uh, sharing that. Even if it's just with yourself, just yeah. Because to, to be able to reflect and go, yeah, I remember that time when yeah. I went through that. Yeah, yeah because each person's brain works completely different than the others, so they have what makes them happy, or, sure. Especially in the nostalgic factor, and. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, okay, this makes me really happy. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna. It helps you find that key point mm-hmm. to keep going back to, so you don't. When you, the depressing times, you're like, don't keep going and going and hit that right. roadblock, and you're like, okay, I need to find a way out of that hole. But music does help a lot, especially coming up with all the bunch of like uh, line lyrics, lyrics, mm-hmm. and. Coming up, the, the coming up with the actual instrumental part is actually the hard part because I don't. I can play piano. That's about right, it. Right. But I can't 
do anything else. So I'm having to use like garage band or trying to figure out what I want to, but once you like know music, you can, it's help. It's easy for you to adapt. It makes you even enjoy listening to music so much more. Mm-hmm. So, and I guess that's what brought me back into the musical theater. Cause I was like, I already had that connection to music. Mm-hmm. I was con- starting to connect it to musicals mm-hmm. and all that. You're like, okay, I really like this. There, I don't want to change this too much. Right. So that's, it's just weird. How long have you been writing music now? I want to say about five years now. Okay. Um, so now if you if you go back five years and you look at the music you you first wrote, yeah. what do you see? Why why was I such an <laughs> emotional little kid when writing all this? Because it's like super depressing. Because I I remember like one of the first songs I wrote was like really really depressing and dark and like how right. I can't escape from this like empty void. I'm like. Right. What the <laughs> hell was going on in my head at this time? And then I look at some more recent stuff. It's like happy, cheesy stuff. I'm like, how did I go from this spectrum of reality right. all the way to this spectrum? I'm like, how? And I'm just like, just growing up and maturing, I guess, is where. Mm-hmm. Because you, 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 don't, you don't ever stop maturing mm-hmm. mentally. Yeah. And you have those minor glimpses where you go back to the immaturity days, yeah. but you're like, it's more easily for you, easily able for you to go back to being more mature in your head and sounding mature mm-hmm. in those regards. It's like I do want to like, r- like actually release at one point once I ever actually get the time and people to, together to do it, but it's mm-hmm. like, it's just sitting away in my closet in a binder right now <laughs> <laughs> with everything else I've written, so... That's amazing. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten to, to writing music in a, in a long time. Usually, it was it was a special event, you mm-hmm. know, like wedding or funeral, whatever, you yeah. know, to, to write the thing. Or like I say, you just whatever. It, but I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah, it's and like, I found that it was it was kind of cathartic and it was nice. And I kind of look back and I'm like, yeah, that's a. But it was mostly for me. Yeah, yeah most of the time it was just for me. I don't go out of my way to like write stuff down. No. It's like if it comes to me, I'll write it down. Yes, you be inspired, whatever, it's, whatever was in the it's moment. Like the inspiration yeah. is like there, and it gets you going. You're right. like, okay, let's keep going, keep going. Right. Next thing you know, you've knocked out maybe five or six songs. You're mm-hmm. like, wow, and then you go like months and months right. without writing anything else. You're like, well, nothing was there for whatever reason. Yeah, because it could be either like relationships, friendships, mm-hmm. yep, even family issues. Like, yep. Absolutely. Anything could cause you to write. Sure. Mm-hmm. Or even like political or even like something, any co- conflict that happens in the world. You're like, mm-hmm. you can draw inspiration from literally anything. There's people I know that they're a speck of dust that could write an entire song. <laughs> <laughs> this like little speck of dust. <laughs> How? <laughs> it's like. The speck of dust. It's mm. so gray and dull. <laughs> You're like... <laughs> and they get all these, like, metaphorical... I'm like... Okay. <laughs> it's literally just a speck of dust. Where are you going with this? <laughs> well, we've, we're so glad you've joined us uh, for the summer. We know you're going to do great things. And we'll, if you ever decide to share your music, let me know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you the question we might ask everyone. If heaven exists, what do you want God to say when you get to the pearly gates? <laughs> are you sure you're in the right place? <laughs> <laughs> um, Is this music yours? <laughs> He's going like, to crank it up. <laughs> it's like... Or what the hell were you thinking when you wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you had some dark times in your life. <laughs> like, okay, if you're looking past this, all right, that's good. I'm good. <laughs> but it's like it's just weird because I've never actually thought of that question before. So I find that it's coming out. There's there's not that many things in life that are important. Yeah, but a lot of things that are important are the things that we at least want to think about. Yeah. Especially death. You don't want to think about Nobody that. wants to think about death. No. And then you have the family members that do die. And you're like, oh, okay, well, now I'm sad. And then you start thinking about how long you have and trying right. to make everything right again with people or mm-hmm. friendships. So mm-hmm. it's just one of those topics you're like, okay. <laughs> I think we'll write a song about that. <laughs>
Ah, uh, maybe not. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Have I written... Uh, maybe, I don't remember. Probably half. Uh, Go back to read your archives, see if you find any <laughs> songs on death there. Yeah. So. We won't turn it into a musical, okay? No. <laughs> I thought about it, but... No. Been there, done that. Nah, nah it's, right. it's too depressing. Let's not do this. Kevin, thanks a lot for being Thank with you. us. Thank you.